Well, just thank you for having me, and it's truly an honor and a privilege to even be on the same program with one of my heroes, uh, Bernice. And I really have to start out by apologizing to you because um, I'm about to ruin your whole lunch. Uh, I want to give a qualification that I am not anti-Centers for Disease Control, I am not anti-EPA, I am not anti-government. But you criticize what you love, you fight for what you love, and I think from this presentation, my point is that what we have right now at these agencies is not good enough. And so with that, uh, I wanted to go into this story, this journey I've been on for 13 years that culminated in Flint, Michigan last year, and make the case of how bad government actually caused this horrific man-made disaster and how good government is our only hope to get that fixed. So, And one of the things I want you to think about is something that I've been, you know, grappling with over my whole career, at least since D.C., Washington, D.C. started, is what price are you willing to pay, both as a professional and as a human being, to defend the public welfare? And so for me, this journey actually started in uh, Washington, D.C. in 2003, when I worked on an event known as, in the press as the Washington, D.C. lead and drinking water crisis. Now, with the benefit of hindsight and research, we now know that this is one of the worst public health disasters um, and, and tragedies in U.S. history. And it's not only U.S. Congress that says that. If you don't trust them, it's also in Wikipedia. You can look it up. <laughs> but there were about uh, 2,000 children not born from exposure to lead in their drinking water, the best-known neurotoxin. It's a, it induces abortions, about 200 late-term deaths and literally thousands of children in Washington, D.C. drinking this water uh, were lead poisoned above CDC's uh, levels of concern. And the other thing that um, makes this fascinating is it's misconduct by government scientists and engineers, the environmental policemen that we pay to protect us, the civil servants, turned into environmental criminals, and also that there's no disputing the harm lead does. Every, it's official U.S. government policy that, that lead in water any lead exposure is dangerous. So when this came out uh, in the news 2004, it was one of the biggest news stories of the year because people in D.C. just went berserk when they found out they'd been drinking high lead in their water. And it was in a um, congressional hearing in March where you got an idea that something wasn't quite right uh, with this whole story. So thing like this happen any place else in the country to this degree? I mean, is there any precedent for this? Uh, there is a precedent. Not to this degree, though, Congressman. I mean, there are instances. Uh, so this is the worst the case that's ever happened in the country uh, uh, in terms of the level and length of exposure to lead through the drinking water. Is that a fair statement? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good point. I, this, um, staff is informing me that at Superfund sites, I mean, there there are lead contamination problems. Oh, hazardous material uh, sites. Well, right, yeah. Right. Um, but in terms of a yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. the, um, so, from the perspective of the lead in the drinking water in the system, um, there are cities in the country that have uh, exceeded action levels under the lead and Well, sure, but an action level but is not 15 to, parts per billion. I, I, so, you know, the truth came out, and the next day, Ben Grumbles, assistant administrator of EPA, was quoted, you'd have to go to a Superfund site to get more lead than what's coming out of the tap of, of D.C. water. And at this point in 2004, uh, there were actually six congressional investigations going on uh, because there was lead high in the U.S. Congress. Uh, President Bush was asked at two White House uh, press conferences whether he was drinking too much lead in the water. And when GAO announced that they were going to get into the ring and start investigating, the city's attitude was take a number. It's like a Soho bakery around here. So many people are investigating. It's going to trip over themselves. So we screwed up in D.C. Uh, EPA tried to do something good. Uh, the high lead was triggered by an EPA regulation inadvertently. Unfortunately, EPA, given D.C. is not the state, EPA has complete oversight responsibility for lead in the drinking water. And the federal government also treats the water. So this is a problem owned from start to finish by the federal government. And one hopes that when we screw up, 
and that's what we do as humans, there should be a Geico commercial, right? We screw up. That we could learn from our mistakes. So it doesn't happen again. But unfortunately, what happened in D.C. was something was about to occur that was to derail any hope that we would learn from this tragedy. And what happened in D.C. was uh, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control came to town and claimed they did a scientific study of lead in the people of Washington, D.C., looking at the worst case exposure over three years. And I kid you not, their conclusion was, amazingly, miraculously, no one was hurt. Now, this contradicted 2,000 years of human experience that goes back to the Roman days. It contradicts dozens of peer-reviewed papers. And we now know, due to a congressional investigation, that the Centers for Disease Control completely falsified um, this report. Uh, I won't go into the details, but on the day that this report came out, the author was actually asked by a CDC colleague, hey, how's it going? And um, they wrote, today's been the first day in over a month there hasn't been a question about this issue in the Washington Post or anywhere else. I guess that means it worked. And so um, how did it work? Uh, it got the perpetrators of this crime off, incredibly. And it prevented us from learning anything from this tragedy. And then even worse is what happened after that. Uh, the agency started to blame the public for what happened. You cannot make this stuff up, people, okay? Two or three days after the Washington Post article came out, uh, someone wrote in to the Washington Times, said, this is all much ado about nothing. It shows how the pa public panics for no reason whatsoever. Uh, EPA, no harm, no foul. And a pediatrician wrote into the Washington Post, said, you know, this, through this amazing experiment, what we learned in D.C. is kids can drink all the lead and water they want and no one will get hurt. And then it gets even worse, if that's possible, because a few a years goes by and the agencies who perpetrated this crime, I kid you not, gave themselves awards for what happened in D.C. So this is a FOIA, Region 3, EPA, the perpetrators of this crime, after they got off and covered it up with the CDC's help, they gave themselves the gold medal highest award that the agency has for public health service. And then, if that's not bad enough or crazy enough, the lies from the CDC report spread elsewhere around the United States and created harm to children in other cities and even around the world. And here's just one example where they found very high lead in a kindergarten classroom in Seattle, and a pediatrician writes in and says, you know, you might think, parents, that you should worry about this, but because of the great work CDC did in Washington, D.C., kids can drink all the lead and water they want. You shouldn't be concerned. So, um, yeah, it worked all right, uh, in the words of the CDC person, and getting everybody off. Now, I won't go into the details. Um, I got really mad about what was happening. I gave up uh, six years of my life to prove that this report was falsified. It was absolutely horrible. It took me 30 hours a week as a volunteer for those six years. But at the end of that time, uh, there was a congressional report written, bipartisan, that agreed that what the CDC did was scientifically indefensible and that they actually created a public health tragedy and prevented us from learning from this mistake. And then even worse, okay, just when you think it can't get worse, not only did they cover this up, but I later found out there were five brave whistleblowers who did their jobs, laid down their professional lives trying to expose what was happening in D.C. to protect the public, and they were fired. The good scientists and engineers who did the right thing got fired. And so what about the CDC? After this was exposed in D.C., you'd think they'd learn from their mistake, you'd be wrong. First thing they did is they wrote a report to, uh, a letter to the Washington Post saying, you know, a few IQ points, seven, a parent won't even notice that loss in their children. Um, their original conclusion, they wrote another falsified report saying that their conclusion was actually the opposite of what they wrote. You cannot make this up, it's Orwellian. And then when that didn't work, they said, you know, looking backwards six years, it's clear this report could have been written a little better, do you think? 
And then Tom Frieden, who's still the head of the CDC to this day, wrapped up his investigation by saying, in our urgency to rapidly assess the situation, we communicated scientific results poorly. That's what we're guilty of. We don't know how to write. CDC can do no wrong. They're incapable of admitting and learning from their mistakes. And so, if you think about the lesson sent, five whistleblowers who did their job fired. What about the perpetrators? Okay, there was a lawsuit initiated in 2009. This is five years after the exposure occurred. Good luck proving what child got lead poison at that time. That's why lying is so effective. Uh, the class action was shown out, thrown out in 2015. Out of 5,000 children who were lead poisoned, five fought to have their day in court. They never got it, but um, the lawsuits uh, were all settled two days ago. And these kids are out of high school now. Parents and families in D.C. whose kids had learning problems did not get an apology. They did not get one penny to help them with their family's health issues that resulted from this tragedy. Which brings us to Flint, 2014-2015. And something this horrible doesn't just happen. It's not one bad apple. It's not one bad agency. You have to have a whole corrupt culture to create the story of what happened in Flint, Michigan. You have to have a situation where you didn't learn anything from the Washington, D.C. tragedy except you can get away with anything. That's what the message was in D.C. So we knew that because we didn't learn from the D.C.-led crisis, another lead crisis would occur, and it just came to Flint, Michigan. So how did this story start? So again, it starts out very, very innocently. Uh, the city tried to switch its water source, a water source they'd use two weeks a year as a backup supply. They wanted to use it for two years while a new pipeline was being built. And here's the famous ribbon cutting ceremony. Uh, this is a historic day for us. Cheers. Yeah, it was historic, all right, not quite for the reasons they thought. Because a civil servant forgot to follow federal corrosion control law, and the corrosive water was put into this distribution system, and it started to eat the pipes up. It started to leach lead into the water. And Flint residents, they knew immediately that something was wrong. So this was on social media not long after the switch was made. People started complaining about rashes, about their hair falling, about breathing difficulties when they bathed or showered. And this one person wrote in and said, you know, to take a bath in Flint, Michigan, you have to use bottled water. And the residents would not stop complaining. The woman in this picture is an epic uh, American hero, uh, a mom, Leanne Walters. Uh, Leanne had a living experiment in front of her, twin boys. One of her boys was lagging in weight and in physical and mental development and she didn't know why. So she looked into it, and she figured out that her child had been lead poisoned, that the source was lead in water, and she didn't stop there. She actually figured out that the state and the city were not using the required corrosion control, and that they had lied about it to the US EPA. Leanne Walters figured that out all on her own. And the residents are complaining because that water was coming out of their tap. And we now know, with benefit of hindsight, it had hazardous waste levels of lead. One sip of that water, 50 milliliters, would raise a child's blood lead from zero to three times CDC levels of concern. Okay? We also know that water contained too much Legionella. Flint residents complained We've got video where they were arrested at a town meeting for complaining about that water coming out of their tap. So Leanne, she had her family protected. She fought to protect other people's children in Flint. She gave up her life. 
One of the people she reached out to was an amazing EPA employee, Mr. Miguel Del Toro. And after he heard this story, he wrote an email, and this is April of 2015, where he said, the law is being broken in Flint, Michigan. These people are under an imminent and substantial endangerment. EPA should exert emergency powers to protect the residents of Flint. His boss, EPA Administrator Susan Hedman, didn't want to get involved in Flint. She wanted the state to handle it. So Miguel was very, very distraught, and months went by of unnecessary exposure. And he decided, ultimately, he was near the end of his career. He was going to risk it all, run the risk of getting fired to make EPA do their job. And frankly, in this corrupt culture at EPA today, the one thing that can really get you fired is doing your job. It's a proven fact, folks. There's a congressional hearing. You can watch porn all day on your computer at EPA and not get fired, but good, honest, ethical, courageous actors are fired from this agency all the time. And Miguel put himself out there, wrote this email, uh, this, this report, that laid out in detail the danger to Flint residents. And he leaked it. Uh, it was uh, released to the press, uh, to myself and Leanne Walters. And he, we thought, there's no way they're going to cover this up. But they did. Miguel's boss apologized to the mayor of Flint, Michigan, for him writing this email. She stood by as the state characterized Miguel Del Toro as a rogue EPA employee who does not speak for the agency. And Miguel was taken off the case. He was told by an EPA ethics officer not to speak from anyone from Flint or about Flint, Michigan again. And so the next day, he wrote his colleagues an email. I'm really tired of the bad actors being defended, bad actions being ignored, and people trying to do the right thing, treated as if we're doing something wrong. I truly, truly hate working here. EPA is a cesspool. So Miguel's off the case. A new EPA employee is in charge of Flint, Michigan. Okay? Let's look at her attitude. Here's an email. Yep, another complaint about our favorite water supply. Let me tell you, this Flint situation is really nasty. People are calling me four-letter words, yell at me and call me a crook. But I'm developing a thick skin. Uh, here's another great email from EPA. I'm not sure Flint is the kind of community we want to go out on a limb for. And so here's the situation in Flint. People are marching in the street. People are getting rashes. This crap is coming out of the tap. And their residents are being told that the water is meeting federal safety standards. It is safe to drink. And just to reinforce that, after talking to Susan Hedman, the mayor goes on TV and says, drink up, Flint, because I drink Flint water, too. Now, to this day, people think what happened in Flint is so evil, there must have been a politician involved somehow. That this Democratic mayor screwed up by going on TV and drinking the water, or the Republican governor, who has nothing to do with this decision about corrosion control. They must be to blame. When in fact, it's just unethical, civil servant, scientists and engineers at the crux of this issue. And at some point, I really have to give credit where credit's due. Because uh, they were so bad, they were good. And, and what I mean by that, it really takes some nerve in Flint, Flint Michigan, a city that's predominantly African-American, the second poorest city in the United States. They're paying the highest water bills in the United States for water that is not suitable, we now know, for anything but flushing toilets. And when the residents complained about this, the state engineers actually laughed at them at this point. They said, Mr. Del Toro has been handled and no one will be helping you. 
So we got a call from them. Uh, they were in tears at that point. Of course, they had the report. They knew there was one child lead poison. The water was crap. And so um, we got really, really mad. I don't remember much about the next few hours. Uh, so um, we, um, we decided we had to break all the rules here. Uh, we launched a self-funded, I'd saved up because I knew this day was coming. Uh, we donated the funding, the technical support, and the analytical expertise to allow Flint residents to do the job that these agencies refused to do. And frankly, we had to declare war on our own corrupt government to try to save these residents in Flint. And so um, it started, we uh, launched this uh, amazing sampling campaign. We sent out test kits to Flint so they could do the EPA required sampling. Uh, the Flint residents were amazing. They returned 90% of these kits, which is unbelievable. And during this time, the state was complaining that Flint residents don't care enough about their water to take water samples. Uh, we knew that this uh, was a war and uh, that Frankly, you'd hope that government officials would be reasonable, that they would listen to scientific reason, but once that uh, doesn't work, you have to resort to the only weapon you have, which is ridicule, because that's the only thing these people understood, unfortunately. Hate to go there, but if that's your last option, uh, you take it. So amongst the things we did, we started simple experiments that even reporters could understand because we needed their help. One of the things we did is took the new water, which was in Flint, and compared it to the old water with steel in it so that people could see what would happen to the iron pipes when this corrosive water was there. You see the orange water on top. You see the relatively clear water on the bottom. You had this less corrosive water before. Now you have the corrosive water. This is what people are complaining about. They're not crazy. This is why we have a federal corrosion control law, people. So the state still insisted the new water was not more corrosive. They called us out on TV. So at that point, um, we also did some testing on uh, lead and copper, and we took these uh, copper pipes with lead solder on it, and we did the test the state should have done before they made the switch. And you can see the white stuff in the water on the left, that's lead. That's hazardous waste levels of lead in the current water that was going into Flint. On the right, you see Detroit, no lead. So you had it good. Now you have it bad. This is what's going on. So we sent these kits to the state who is claiming that there's nothing more corrosive about Flint water. Because one of the great things about science is it's reproducible, right? I can do this experiment in my lab. Please do this in your lab and see what we're seeing. They refused to do the experiment. So at that point, I have to apologize, we really crossed the line, we got really nasty, and uh, we enlisted a, a classroom of fourth graders, <laughs> and they repeated the experiment, and they wrote up their results on a website, and they got on TV, and the state looked ridiculous. Because anyone could see what Flint residents already knew, which was this water was eating up their pipes and putting lead into the water supply. And if that isn't, bad enough, and I, I somewhat apologize for this at this point. Um, I went nuclear, and go to the next slide. Um, we enlisted little brownie troop scientists, <laughs> and this was Dr. Mona's um, brownie troop, and uh, they wrote letters to the governor, and uh, this was picked up on the national news, and we even took these letters and sent it to EPA headquarters in Washington, D.C., with a note that said, isn't it interesting, little brownie troop scientists understand what's going on in Flint, Michigan, when you folks at EPA don't seem to care. So it wasn't long after that that um, uh, the state was trying to respond to us. <laughs> so this is from an actual email. Uh, if we're going to take action, it's got to be soon, because before Virginia Tech scandalizes us, in DC it took them six years, uh, we're only two weeks into this at this point. I'd learned a thing or two over the years, by the way. Um, not good, and um, that was the least of their worries. So um, we went up and actually stood on the lawn with Flint residents, which you are risking your professional career as a professor, I can tell you that. Um, when I gave this quote, 
epically bad decision, the reporter's jaw just about dropped. And he said, is that on the record? Um, so yeah, so there it was, front page news um, the next day. And we also worked with an amazing uh, pediatrician from Hurley Medical Center who uh, repeated the work uh, that we did in DC using her own hospital's blood lead data to show that the incidence of childhood lead poisoning in neighborhoods in Flint in, it had tripled. So uh, it wasn't long before it was in the front page of the New York Times and the impossible occurred. Flint was able to switch back to the old water supply. Uh, America soon learned about what we presumed when we went in there, that an environmental crime had been perpetrated by our government against one of our most vulnerable populations. And President Obama, he declared a national emergency and it kind of became a cause du jour of celebrities. Uh, everyone had to give water to um, Flint and uh, they have so much water now, like, I mean, it's like a hoarding mentality and one of the biggest dangers, and I kid you not, we were in some homes uh, last month and literally there's so much water in some of these houses, they're about to collapse. Like the, the floor is literally bucking because people don't trust the water uh, at all. And so FEMA came in and uh, did the testing of children's lead and blood and the city also looks like a war zone because one of the things that resulted from not having corrosion control was it destroyed their water infrastructure. And Flint now has about 100 times the main breaks of a normal US city, and this is what a commute looks like in Flint, Michigan now, and so much damage has been done to the system. There is no way Flint residents can ever afford to fix it. It's not even possible, not an option. They're already paying the highest water rates in the country. So I was uh, called to testify to Congress twice, uh, both in February and then in March. And I wish I could tell you that the agencies learned anything from this disaster. But the US EPA testified under oath, quote, we had nothing to do with what happened in Flint, Michigan. We didn't know if we could enforce federal law in Flint. The state strong-armed us. So if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're going to repeat them again. And you ask yourself, like, what on earth does it take to get an unethical, corrupt employee fired? Honestly, what does it take in this country? So all of this damage has been done to Flint's system. Well, something unusual then happened. It got on Comedy Central. Uh, next slide. It's not working. It worked before. <laughs> it worked during practice. OK. Uh, that's, if you can figure that out, that would be great. So whenever it does work, let me know. And anyway, okay. But anyway, it got co on Comedy Central. We became an international embarrassment. And um, uh, EPA Administrator uh, Susan Hedman finally resigned. That's what it takes, again, is ridicule. Um, to date, next slide, eight civil servants have been criminally indicted for what occurred in Flint, Michigan. And amongst the fallout is a complete loss of trust not only in Flint, Michigan, but around the country in their water supply. Uh, because uh, we found out what we've been screaming for 10 years was that many cities around the country like Flint were cheating on their lead and copper rule monitoring. They were sampling in ways that makes the lead and water look lower when it's not. And even when they're cheating, there's 5,000 water systems in the US that are exceeding the action level. So basically, every rock you turn over in this country, something slimy is coming out. And it's also corrupt ethical culture. So this came out just a few weeks ago where uh, Pittsburgh was caught and they were, had too much lead in their water and the employee at the water company admitted that if he had followed the law and failed the lead and copper rule, he felt like he would have been fired. So because of this, uh, bottled water sales um, in the US have exceeded soda sales for the first time. And then if that's not bad enough, uh, they looked again in the US Congress and they found lead in the water there still. 
So if you think at any given time, half our uh, government's crazy, there's your answer. Uh, lead in water of the Congress, where we can least afford uh, a loss of, of IQ points, believe me. So, and then, you know, it's the, it gets worse. And because lead is just one example of what goes wrong when you don't use corrosion control. And one of the things we predicted before we went into the Flint is they would actually have a Legionella problem. Legionella is a bacteria that grows in your home water system. You breathe it in the showers, it can kill you. Uh, unfortunately, we now know that that prediction came true. So the emails we got through FOIA showed that in 2014, everyone knew, except the people in Flint, that there was a Legionella outbreak. And they didn't want to tell people because announcing that would inflame the situation. The CDC Legionella group is the best in the world. Amazing, wonderful people. Uh, they wrote an email that said, this is uh, one of the worst outbreaks in history. This should really be investigated. This is in uh, 2015. And what was the response from the state? The outbreak's over, when it wasn't. Six more people died. And so, um, to wrap this up and bring it full circle, um, I can tell you from my experiences over the last uh, several years that unfortunately doing the right thing, even as a professor, it is not rewarded. Uh, you are going to pay a horrible professional price for speaking out against government corruption, no matter how bad. Uh, and that's why it's unusual. And unfortunately, as scientists and engineers, we have a culture of cowardice. We are trained cowards. And to the extent that we're willing to be overlooking problems like this, allowing blind stop spots to occur, injustices are perpetuated, that is true for all of us. And to the extent that we allow it to occur, occur evil will be victorious. Uh, history has shown that time and time again. And frankly, to me, you know, people ask me, why did you do what you did? And I tell students that the ultimate punishment for being a coward is that you have to live in the world you help create. And I can't live in a world where science and engineering is used to poison little kids. I will not live in that world under any circumstances. And so during this journey, uh, I met some amazing people. So Leanne Walters, hero mom, my students call her Mother Grizzly. And if there's one lesson I want you to take from this, is the most powerful scientific force in the universe is a mother protecting their children. And if you mess with that, she will come and screw you up. <laughs> and you don't want to go there. Do not go there, OK? They messed with the wrong person in Flint, Michigan, and Leanne Walters. And thankfully, we had so many amazing actors. I mean, it takes 20, 30 miracles to occur to essentially do what we did in Flint, to topple a branch of government and allow these residents to get to the truth. We played our role. Uh, Miguel, if he hadn't been there, ACLU Michigan, all of these amazing actors, Dr. Mona stood up to reach this critical mass of moral courage to put down their own lives with no profit motive whatsoever, put aside all political differences. OK, in this picture, uh, we have a renounced Catholic, a socialist, a communist, and a Republican. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it never came up, people. Because there's a common morality here that often gets lost uh, in today's world. And uh, thankfully, in Flint, uh, that did not get lost. Uh, Flint desperately needs our help to get back on their feet. There's no way that they can recover from this tragedy. Uh, thankfully, this is just today. Um, another uh, about $100 million uh, is going to be flowing to Flint, Michigan to help recover from this disaster. To date, there's been about $675 million donated, and it proves my point that when an environmental injustice is exposed, People from all around the country, from both political parties, suck it up and try to make that right. And we did that in Flint, 
and it's very, very reassuring. This is $67,000 in relief per child in Flint, Michigan. And you compare that to the Washington, D.C. tragedy, which was 30 times worse. D.C. kids, if it was prorated, would have got about $10 billion. They got nothing. Nothing. And then the other thing is, if we do not learn from this horrible tragedy in Flint, and I see no signs that we have, it's going to happen again. But the miracle that exposed that problem probably will not. That's the amazing thing as I stand here today, to think that if we had not done our part and all of these other people had not, no one would have even known about what happened in Flint, Michigan. You can always blame these problems on something else. Bad parenting, bad schools, they don't know how to operate their distribution system. No one, no one would have known. And I think that's something we all uh, have to keep in mind when we go about our work. And what price are you willing to pay to prevent an injustice like this from happening? So with that, uh, thank you very much. And if you can get that Comedy Central clip to play, please, it played, right? So turn your computer off, turn it on, I don't care. OK, great. OK, I think we have time for some questions, if people have them. I don't know, maybe not, while we're trying. Yes, sir. We worked with some residents there, and uh, we only took a few samples. Now realize, you know, we've got a tiger by the tail trying to help Flint recover, and I get, actually, I get 10 phone calls a day from people um, who think they're living in the next Flint, and it, it kills me that I can't help them, because uh, we went into debt, $300,000 to fight this Flint battle. I spent on my own money. Um, thankfully, through social media and GoFundMe, we've got 90% of that back, but, you know, cost money to do this sort of work. Um, we did do a few samples there, and we didn't see um, any problems with existing laws. So that doesn't mean that there's not problems. People should look into this. We need to be checking up on the environmental policemen all around this country, unfortunately, in the same way that we now have to check up on our real policemen, um, that this problem was occurring with policing and poor minority communities and no one realized what was going on until we had video cameras and uh, we've got to learn to deal with that but we also have to deal with this issue. What do we do about corrupt environmental policemen? No one ever thought that civil servants with no profit motive whatsoever would behave in such a way. We have no check and balance on their power. None. Yes, sir. Right, there's a standardized protocol that's required by the US EPA that if you follow it and do not cheat, um, you can determine whether you're meeting the law that we all agreed on, the lead and copper rule. And here's what rips at my heart. If the law had been followed in Washington, D.C., if the law had been followed in Flint, Michigan, none of this would have occurred. Laws were broken. So, all you got to do is follow the existing law. Now realize, unfortunately, the law does not protect us all. The law actually allows any level of lead in some people's houses, and we haven't really been honest about that to people because it's a shared responsibility. Uh, the city government has to do their job, and the people ultimately have to do their job that live in the house. I mean, there's no way that they can treat the water to completely stop this problem. Uh, so we have to do a better job educating people as well. Oh, okay. Well, if you have a lead pipe in this country, one of the great things we learned, unfortunately, I guess it's not great, but one of the scientific advances we have is uh, you can never assume your water's safe ever, no matter how much you test it. Uh, you, you should just buy a, a lead filter to protect yourself and your family. If you live in a house without a lead service line coming in, uh, you can buy the filter. These filters are just $30 or so. 
Uh, in general, the tragedy is that in 90% plus of the house, there's no problem whatsoever. But the loss of trust is so profound, and this is such a difficult problem, we reached a tipping point where no one trusts anybody anymore. I mean, that's what, that's what happened. Can you play the video? Okay. The saddest thing about this leak is how little it would have cost to prevent it all. The fix was about $100 a day. All of this could have been avoided for just that small amount of money. $100 a day. Why didn't you say something? I want to call out to all my people in Africa right now watching The Daily Show. <laughs> because my friends, for only $100 a day, <laughs> we can save a village in America and get these people drinking the water that they so badly need for just the price of five cups of coffee in New York. Okay, you can see, you can see how bad that cut, so. Anyway, you guys are awesome, dude. Good, thank you so much.